Welcome everyone on this Monday, December 12th, 2016. I am Luke Thomas and this is the Monday Morning Analyst here on MMA Fighting. Hope you're doing well. Thank you so much for joining me. A lot to get to today, so not a moment to waste. Three parts to the podcast. We sort of give an overview of the various cards over the weekend. We take a look at a couple of things or maybe one or two things in slides in the second segment and we take a look at what's coming up in the week ahead. So without further ado, there was a lot to get to. I don't have a ton of time to get into all of it, but I'm going to get to just a few things that we have to um, between the two UFC events, and then there was a Bellator event, and there was a bit of a Glory event. So let's just get right down to that now. Okay, first things up. UFC 206. This took place at the Air Canada Centre in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Great attendance, 18,057 for a total gate of $1.843 million. In the main event, Max Holloway defeating Anthony Pettis at 450 of the third round. First person to ever stop him. Uh, incredible, incredible job by Max Holloway. Um, I, I watched the fight again last night. He was switching stances again through combinations. In rounds, he would spend large parts in southpaw and then other parts in orthodox, mostly orthodox. But there were stretches, minutes at a time, where he would just stay in southpaw, I think taking away some of the weapons of Anthony Pettis. Some of the people noted that Pettis losing the ability to throw the right hand dramatically impacted his, his performance, and I certainly wouldn't disagree with that, but I'm not. it's not clear to me he would have won uh, no matter what. I felt like Pettis was just the guy who said it before. He makes adjustments, um, gets better with range, stays in safe distances when he can, and slowly sort of gets into space um, uh, as, he, as, as uh, opportunities present themselves. Was fighting at home for that body kick, and then doubled up on it, and then threw like a 15-punch like a combination to close the show. So you're talking about a guy who's just at all, all all those always when he exits combinations, he's always defensively responsible with his head. Now that maybe, maybe that makes him susceptible to the body if people are watching tape on him, but if you're just trying to catch him at the end of a combination as he exits with a head kick, it's going to be very hard to do. It's going to be very hard to do. So something to keep in mind, Max Holloway, incredible. And by the way, as I say this, it appears Jose Aldo will accept a fight with him in UFC 208, so that should be a hell of a scrap. But uh, Max Holloway is your interim featherweight champion, for whatever that's worth, and um, uh, looked phenomenal. Anthony Pettis missing weight, of course, saying he's going to go back to 155. I don't know what that means for him up there, but obviously 145 is just not a place he can reasonably say he can make consistently if you can't make it for it you know whatever you make of that title it was a title fight you had to hit 145 and he couldn't even make it with a one pound allowance over so something to keep in mind um Donald Cerrone taking on Matt Brown he wins via head kick 34 seconds of the third round so there'll be a week coming up where we won't have the MMA analyst and I'm going to do it on Cerrone's switch kick to the head because he's done it a number of times now and there's something to it so I'm going to want to break that down I never get the chance to do like longitudinal Studies. I have to do them the weekend after, but um, I thought he looked like typical Cerrone. This was the first time, though, that it appeared that the size of a true welterweight gave him some issues. I'm not saying that it wouldn't have against Rick Story if things had gone a little bit differently. I'm just saying Matt Brown in the clinch appeared to be, have a clear strength advantage, or at least you know put Cerrone in a position where he wasn't nearly as comfortable as he ordinarily would be. I think uh, on the ground, Matt Brown showing a great guard, but in the end, Matt Brown just... Um, biting on a lot of feints, taking that low stance and that switch kick from Cerrone to the head, he can throw it in an instant. And if you're just crouched low and you get caught looking or you're reading the the offense wrong, he's going to light you on fire. Did it to him, did it to some other guys. Uh, Adriano Martins, uh, I mean, you, you, you take your pick. He's done it. Um, Melvin Gallard. So it's a nasty, vicious weapon from Donald Cerrone that we're going to have to take a look at. And here this guy goes at welterweight, man. He can't be stopped now. I think Brown has lost, uh, I think, five of his last six, something like that. He's in a bad slump. I don't know what's next for him, but Cerrone, sky's the limit, you know. Maybe he'll take a fight with Demi and Maya. I don't know. He wants to get on that Colorado card in January. Would love to see it happen, but the guy is absolutely an elite, elite, elite welterweight. Kind of crazy. You know, Benson Henderson and him had a tough fight at uh, lightweight, and then uh, they both went to welterweight directions, and they've had very different fortunes there. Um, although, who knows, maybe Koreshkov would beat Cerrone and, uh, given the opportunity. I, I don't know. But um, great performance in some ways by both guys, but definitely by Donald Cerrone. Cub Swanson and Duho Choi, uh, he wins 30-27, 30 30 29 28 What do you say about this? Here's what I would say. Look, we can, we can heap on all of these praising moments. You know, We can heap on all of these um, 
flowery language about what we saw. It was incredible. It was a brawl in every sense of the word. There was some measure of technique, I think, early on, but that largely got thrown out the window. I love it when older fighters with a chip on their shoulder come into big bouts of consequence. I'll be honest, I had slept on Cub Swanson, and uh, you know I thought Duho Choi was just going to overwhelm him with power. And he didn't. And Cub Swanson really put it on him. And something to be said, not really for the chin of Duho Choi, um, but his his mental resilience too. I don't. I, don't, I never got the sense that he was out of it. Um, he looked a little bit frazzled at the end because he just couldn't find an opening for his offense. But I don't think he ever mentally was like, "I'm quitting in here." I never ever got that sense from him. So that was pretty incredible. The chin on Choi is just. I mean, a fire hydrant, granite, oak, whatever you want to call it, incredible. Uh, the only thing I would say is, if you're looking to like, you know, w- Cubs' weaknesses, I think are pretty well known at this point. He's got a lot of strengths, got a lot of weaknesses. But for Choi, we're still like learning more about him. I do think that there is a measure to like his offensive hand speed and his and the rotation of his hips are incredible. His hips are so strong, right? He's able to turn them standing or even underneath. He's able to turn his hips to get his base to go a certain direction. That's not an obvious thing. He's very very strong. I think it's where a lot of his power comes from. He doesn't move his head a lot, and he can be countered. Um, if he can beat you with hand speed and power, you know you you don't really have a prayer. But if you can be sharp and you can counter him and you can get him backing up, uh, he's hard to put away. Of course, uh, even Cub Swanson couldn't do that, and Cub Swanson was landing punches on him. That sent that sent George Roop's mouthpiece into the bleacher. Sorry, I got a weird phone call, um, and. He, Choi just took all of it. But I do think it's fair to say, well, there's a lot of reasons to like what Choi was doing. There's also a lot of reasons to be like, mm, there's some work to be done. There's some work to be done. Uh, Kelvin Gastelum defeating Tim Kennedy, 245 of the third round via K- uh, TKO. I don't know. To me, on the one hand, Kelvin Gastelum looks good at middleweight every time he goes. To me, on the other hand, he has had good performances at welterweight too. To me, um, I don't know if he can make weight. I certainly hope. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what his future lies. It really depends upon him and his management in the UFC. But I don't think we lose either way, provided he can reliably find a way to make weight. He has made weight a number of times at welterweight. Everyone's like, he always misses. He doesn't always miss. He misses enough where it's an issue. Um, but there's a lot of guys who have missed weight like that, and we don't have nearly this same level of condemnation like John Lineker. Um, there's also an open question of, did, did, did Kelvin Gastelum look good no matter what with his boxing and the fluidity of it and everything else? Sure. Uh, he had a little trouble fighting the hands in the first round of Tim Kennedy. Tim Kennedy was doing a really good job of just tight wasting, which can be an exhausting way to compete for both guys. But the thing that got me, and I mentioned this like on my post-fight reaction immediately after the fight, was um, Kennedy fought Gastelum like Gastelum had missed weight. Like, he was trying to weigh on him with his wrestling. He was trying to go to the body a lot. And it just wasn't having a strong effect because he was super fresh at 185. Um, which, again, might feed the argument that that's where ultimately he needs to stay. But um, a weird game plan from Tim Kennedy. I think the two years off really showed. I don't think that was the best Tim Kennedy we've ever seen by a mile. So there's an open question of, one, you know, where should... Kelvin Gastelum compete, and we can all have different opinions about it. And two, was that really the best Tim Kennedy? I don't think so. Again, maybe the best Kelvin Gastelum that we saw that night would have beaten him anyway. In fact, I probably would bet on it. But just sort of pointing out that like, I do think it is fair to at least raise the question about what kind of fighter Tim Kennedy was on that Saturday. Remember, he had to cut all that weight for 205 and then come right around and doing it again for 206. It's a total of the body, and maybe that explains it, maybe it doesn't. But I think it's at least worth raising the issue. Emil Weber Meek taking on Jordan Meehan defeats him uh, across the board 29 28. Jordan Meehan just sort of didn't have a whole lot of oomph in that second and third round. Looks pretty good in the first. Obviously, is technical everywhere. To me, it looks like Meek is physically un, uh, a powerful freak, but a little bit undisciplined. But he's also young, and if he can really sort of shore up some of these things, that, f- that, that physicality can overwhelm guys. Uh, Misha Serkunov taking on Nikita Krylov wins via guillotine choke 438 in the first round. We'll take a look at that in the next segment. Uh, Olivier Aubin Mercier defeating Drew Dober rear naked choke 257 of the second round. Two things to note: I thought Drew Dober's footwork was great, but he was a little upright. There wasn't a lot of head movement and fainting out in and out and going side to side. It was he was going side to side with his feet, but his head never worked. So when he came in a straight line to attack, 
uh, Aubin Marseille was able to just crack him with a jab every time. Uh, and then, of course, Aubin Marseille in the end getting the choke. Didn't even get the gable grip. Kind of got like an X as he tried to pull his gloves together. And then you can see him engage his lats. Your lats are essentially which the muscles you use to do pull-ups. Especially if you do them this way, not not underhand. If you do them overhand, it's your back muscles, basically. Not, not the upper back, not the lower back. But that middle back, the wings, as it were. And watch his lats engage, right? That's what you need for the deadlift. you got to get your lats engaged to be able to hold the bar close to you. And you could see him squeeze it all together, man. That must have been a hellacious squeeze if you didn't even have a gable grip. You just had like an X and you're able to uh, ultimately get it. Uh, Vivian Pereira defeated Valerie Letourneau in the worst fight imaginable. Split decision. I'm not even going to read the scores. Uh, Matthew Lopez defeating Mitch Gagnon. 29-28, 29-28, 29-27. Had a rough first round, but the truth of the matter is he came back from it, showed a lot of resiliency, and this kid was hitting perfectly timed doubles. He hit a lateral drop in that first round after he had given up double underhooks and was able to pass to Mount. He was just a better wrestler and a better grappler, and you saw that. Uh, Lando Venata defeating John McDessey, spinning wheel kick. He called it a spinning hook kick, so I'm going to call it a spinning hook kick at 140 of the first round. Um... I'm not an expert on wheel kicks versus hook kicks. There's a few things I know about them, but whatever the case may be, he called it a spinning hook kick himself in the post-fight presser. So I'm going to call it that, and we'll look at that in the second segment as well. Rustam Habilov defeating Jason Sago, 30-27 across the board. Just better wrestling essentially was the difference here. Sago, you know, playing a little bit of guard, using a half a rubber guard, not stalling because he was trying to connect offense to it, just couldn't really get it going. There was some decent guard play, I think, at, at times on this card, but there was also a lot of guard play that just wasn't necessarily that great either this weekend, um, or I should say this Saturday or this Friday. And um, I don't think it's an indictment on guard play all that in MMA generally, but certainly shows that there can be, you know, the occasional bright spots, but there might be some larger questions about the level of guard play, um, or at least uh, to the extent that people want to... Um, Use it. Uh, Dustin Ortiz defeating Zach Makovsky. Split decision 29-28, 28-29, 29-28. Essentially just sort of better wrestling uh, and top control. And better grappling. Better scrambling from Dustin Ortiz. Fire of the Night, Cub Swanson versus Duho Choi. Performance of the Night, Holloway and Lando Venata. Now, there was another UFC event which we'll go to very, very quickly. This took place on Friday night. It was not very good. By the way, my fighter of the card from UFC 206, I give it to either Holloway or Venata. So, we'll go through this very quickly. UFC Fight Night, what number was this? 102? Yeah, from Albany. Lewis versus Abdurakimov. Um, Lewis defeats him. It was terribly boring for three rounds. He kept giving up the takedown. And then finally gets on top in the fourth round and just pounds him out. There's nothing else to really say about it. However, how about Francis and Ganu? Take it on. Anthony Hamilton wins at 157 of the first round. Jesus Christ. Did y'all see this fight? If you haven't, find a way to do it. Everyone talks about the freakish power in terms of striking of Francis Ngannou, and they should. The level of strength he has in grappling is nuts. He had a Kimura grip from cross body and just lifted the other guy up who was 255 pounds and put his wrist behind him. It's one thing to get him to hike him up a little bit so you can get the arm to go out and around as you try to like rotate it over. Right? We talked about Kimuras from half guards with Demetrius Johnson and Tim Elliott. I'm the kind of guy who can do them because of my body type. You secure the wrist, you go over the top, and you kind of just rotate. Right? You just rotate as you're going over. Um, and But even I can't get the wrist behind him. He just sat this guy up and drove the wrist behind him. Francis Ngannou must be otherworldly strong a freak athlete like understand that jiu-jitsu and grappling they're based on certain assumptions of the limits of human strength or flexibility or you know it's essentially biomechanics and physics put together right it's that that's what jiu-jitsu is this doesn't work because of this this doesn't work because of that francis and Ganu just sort of walks in there gets a double wrist lock and just and just hercules him. Uh, and it was pretty technical, too, because he actually had to follow a little bit as Hamill got away. He, had, he actually put a knee on belly on there, so I'm not even saying he's not technical. Uh, I'm just saying, <laughs> good luck fighting that guy. What a mutant of a human being Francis Ngannou is. Corey Anderson defeating Sean O'Connell via TKO punches. 236 of the second round. It appeared that Sean O'Connell might have retired after the fight. Uh, Jean Vellante defeating Saperbeck Safarov. Safarov looking like a cab driver in a second to third world country, 
taking this fight on very short notice and showing incredible levels of toughness. What a junkyard dog he is. On the prelim card, Justin Kish, Justine Kish defeating Ashley Yoder. Bit of a back and forth in this one. Randy Brown from making a fight uh, wins easily over a Brian Camozzi, 125 of the second round via TKO from Knees and Punches. Uh, Gerald Mearshart, uh, I can't pronounce his last name, Shert, defeating Joe Giolitti, Giolotti, excuse me, via Anaconda Choke at 412 of the first round. Very nice Anaconda Choke. Andrew Sanchez and Trevor Smith had a very uh, not memorable fight, 327 across the board for Andrew Sanchez. Shane Burgos, Burgos, however you probably pronounce it, had to cut his hair mid fight, but he defeats Tiago Trator. 30, 26, 29, 28, 29, 27. Mark, I keep pronouncing his name incorrectly. Diakisi defeating Frankie Perez. Another tough fight, 29, 28 across the board. Ryan Janis defeating Keith Barish, 29, 28 across the board. And then Juliana Lima defeating JJ Aldrich. Aldrich getting the call up from uh, Invicta. She's very good, but I wonder if she's not even a real straw weight. She might be an atom weight fighter. Uh, Lima was just too big and too powerful for him. 30-27 across the board for her. Five of the night went to Volante versus Safarov. And performance of the night went to Nganu and Gerald Mearshart. I, I mean, I don't know how you don't pick Francis Nganu. Blown away by this guy. Absolutely blown away. Okay, very quickly. Bellator 168 was on Saturday. This took place at the Nelson Mandela Forum. There was an attendance. Of, oh, by the way, uh, the attendance for Fight Night Albany... 6,216 for a gate of 411,000. This took place at the Times Union Center. Okay. Bellator. 168. Sakara versus Beltran. The, that was not the original main event. It got knocked out when Carvalho and Manhoff couldn't have a rematch, but neither here nor there. Uh, for a gate of almost a million dollars, 981,000, and attendance of 8,113 in Florence, Italy. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but Alessio Sakara defeated Joey Beltran. Essentially just counterpunched him. And caught him. Beltran used to have an incredible chin, but he has lived on it, and um, he couldn't even last a minute and 30 seconds into this fight, unfortunately. Goichi Yamauchi taking on Valeriu uh, Merceo, however you probably pronounce it. This Italian kid gave him the business early, knocked him down, had ferocious ground and pound, but just really a very technically unrefined game. Uh, and Goichi was able to lock up a triangle at 333 of the first round. And then lastly, Ed Ruth taking the fight on very short notice. Took this guy down, passed him out, and just banged on him. Uh, another minute and 33 seconds, and then beat him there. A couple other results on this, not worth discussing much. Clever Silva defeating Felipe Lins. By the way, for Ed Ruth, I think this is a good thing. Flying overseas, getting a little more experience, getting your feet wet. Still seems a little bit hittable on the feet early. Likes to counter with his physicality, and there's a couple times where he gets caught flat-footed. I'd like to see him incorporate a little more movement to begin, and then go into his wrestling. But once his wrestling gets going, these, these guys just don't have anything for him. John Salter defeating Claudio Anichiaricchio, whatever, 140 of the first round. There were some kickboxing results on there. I'm not going to go into them. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, there was Glory 36, Glory Collision. Rico Verhoeven had taken on Batterhari. The atmosphere was incredible. It got stopped, and Rico was essentially declared the winner because he uh, uh, Batterhari broke his right arm, I believe. You can watch it. To me, I thought it was pretty competitive early. Batter didn't look like exactly like himself. He looked a little hesitant. In fact, it was Rico who was backing him up. Rico looked a little bit more refined, but he was getting caught. Um, it just looked like the guy who was moving forward and being more active on offense not only was winning the battle positionally, but was just getting the other guy to just try and sneak a shot here or there. Um, so they, I felt like they were fairly evenly matched-ish. I mean, Rico looked better, but... Nevertheless, um, Batter didn't look terrible, but Batter's coming off, you know, these incredible layoffs, and uh, who knows what really is going on in his head. But uh, I guess they're going to do a rematch eventually. Gokan Saki apparently wants a piece now, so that should be fun. Okay, no more. With that out of the way, let us take a look at Venata and his spinning hook kick, or whatever the hell it is, in the second segment. And let's also take a look at Misha Serkunov and that incredible shin sweep he hit on Nikita Krilov. Let's do that now. Lando Venata versus John McDessie from the prelims, UFC 206, Toronto, Canada. Why did I pick this? For a couple of reasons. One, it was a spectacular KO, right? The guy goes and gives Tony Ferguson all he can handle and then does this to John McDessie. This is John McDessie's move, by the way. Um, and if that doesn't tell you he's legit, I don't really know what will. But there's a couple other things about this that really caught my attention. Number one... Um, if you look at the that that sidekick that they all that that Venata does, and we'll go through this fight. We're gonna go through the whole fight only because it's like a minute and twenty seconds or something. But 
I want you to pay attention to something, not merely in this fight, but in the greater context. Lando Venata throws that sidekick. Who else throws that sidekick? Now, I don't mean that exact same sidekick, but the point being is a lot of these Jackson Wink guys throw this thing. Carlos Condit, John Jones, Donald Cerrone, I could go on. They all use it a little bit differently. John Jones in the Rampage fight kind of used it to injure Rampage's knee. I know we all have different opinions about that, but I'm just sort of pointing out it's different applications. Here, it certainly had one application, I think, both to measure, to time, and to get the process of the ultimate kick going. It's all part of the same, you know, effort. Uh, other guys use it as a way to back people up. Other guys way, get, get it as a way to steer people certain directions. It's It should be noted that that, that front leg sidekick that they do to the, to the knee or to the, to the hip, depending on where they throw it, the Jackson and Wink guys are innovating it. And I don't think they get enough credit for it. And and this is this is part of the guy who's who's leading that charge. So here we go. Let's go through these slides here and see what we see. That's the first thing. The second thing I want you to notice is Lando Venata never really cuts off the cage from um, John McDessie. I think he wants him to go certain directions. And what I think happened, and I have reason to believe this, in um, speaking to some of the people close to Venata. They kind of knew he had certain tendencies about how he liked to exit from certain sequences. Sometimes he would exit to his weak side. Sometimes he would exit to his strong or power side. And I think what you're going to see here is they just knew it was going to happen. Like some people were asking, was it accidental that Macdessi walked into the spinning hook kick? And by the way, that's what it was. Uh, you know, certainly Rogan's a black belt in Taekwondo. I am not. I'm a nothing in Taekwondo. But even Venata, after the fight, called it a spinning hook kick. That's what he said he was training. That's what he said he threw. So um, I'll take his word for it on this particular circumstance. Also, those things are hard to call in real time. You know, Joe Rogan knows what he's talking about, obviously. Um, but, okay, neither here nor there. Um, it wasn't an accident that McDessie walked into it. That was all part of the plan. I think you're going to see why. He never really tries to cut off the cage and force him to go certain directions. He wants him to react how he normally does and even let him walk into certain ways where he thinks he's going away from the power side of of uh, Venata, right? If he walks this way, he's walking away from the power side, but he's walking in to the spinning back kick, or excuse me, the spinning hook kick. All right, so let's take a look at these slides. By the way, this is when the fight just started. There's no clock here because the clock hasn't even come on the screen yet. So here we are. You can see him walking before the clock even started. What's he doing? Front leg side kick. And he doesn't really throw it to the knee like John Jones, almost like a stomp. He kind of just throws it to the thigh. And probably in this particular case, just getting loosened up, gauging reaction, seeing how far he can get with it, just starting things off. All right, here we are, 453. You can see him doing a, a few different things, right? Here he is raising his hands. He's going to faint as he steps in. Right here, he's going to throw the right, and he's going to catch him. And watch what he does. He exits off to the left every time. Like that. Now, Magdesi either goes back or away, depending on what happens. But it's something that Venata did. I'm not entirely clear about why he did it. You know, partly was, of course, to exit the combination without being hit. That's a given. But, I mean, what else was he trying to do there? It seems like there was something else uh, he was trying to do either. And you'll see he stutter steps it and throws a right in different circumstances. But he always exits off to that left like that. I'm kind of curious to see why he would do that. But neither here nor there. Another sequence, right? Comes in, what do you see him doing? Right away, throwing it, right? And now you're going to see it again. He's going to sort of faint with the right, or faint with the left, stutter step, then throw with the right, and then exit off to his left. And he kind of backs up here because I think Macdessy saw that one a little bit earlier and kind of circled away. Just sort of showing you some of the things that Venata is doing. But what you notice he's not doing, he's not cornering him. He's not trying to back him up against the fence. There's none of that. He's allowing Macdessy at all these different times to circle and to find open space. All right, here we go, 30 seconds in. Shows a high guard. What's he going to do? He sort of fates his different position here with his feet, sort of changes his base a little bit, does the side kick. Now, what's he going to do to follow it up? Of course, he's going to vary everything. He's going to lean in with the right hand. The right hand kind of, it looks like it lands bad here. It only landed partially. And then what's he going to do? Exit off to the left. Here he is again, just a few seconds later. Throwing again, that side kick. And he, you can see Jones kind of throws it around the knee. Venata kind of throws it closer to the mid-thigh, top of the hip. I think a little bit of it here got parried. Right? He closes distance. Where does McDessie go? Away from the power. 
He likes to exit from some of these times away from the power. And Venata sees that. Venata already knew, I think, it was going to happen. I think watching tape, you see Magdesi do that. But I think Venata was like, yep, there he goes. Off to that right side, right off the tee. This is like, look, they happened right in succession. Boom, lands it. And again, he's not throwing it with a ton of authority necessarily, right? What does he do? He backs up, circles away from the power hand, what would eventually be the spinning hook kick. All right, so what does Venu do? Venata kind of follows him, and you see that. All right, but we see this red dot here. It's not a sniper. It's my camera. I'm trying to find a new way to record these to make it easier. You could see uh, Venata sort of reaching with a kick here. What happens? This is one sort of moment Magdesi had that I thought was kind of good. You can see how tall Venata is standing in front of Magdesi. And when Magdesi reads it, Magdesi, you see, had a lower stance the whole time. Lands a nice jab to the body here. Really, really good. In fact, when the fight was over, you could see how he was pink uh, on his chest. Um, you know, there wasn't a whole lot to say for Magdesi in this fight, but uh, he did land a couple nice jabs to the body. This was the best of them. We keep going. Here's Venata. What's he doing? Sort of faking that leg. Rising. Look, you can see where it landed. See how pink it is? Anyway, uh, raising the lead leg, trying to get a reaction, trying to make him confused. Steps in to range, throws the leg kick instead. All right, they're back at it. What's he doing? Lowering his level, kind of shimmering his hands. Dives in, sort of darts in with the right hand. Exits out to the left. All right, same thing over and over again. Here we are a little bit later. Another jab to the body from Macdessie. This one misses as a counter from... Venata, they keep going. What's he doing? Raising that leg. He almost throws this like a question mark kick where he steps in, right? He raises it again and then almost like pivots his heel underneath. This time fires a jab. Okay, this is like the beginning of the end here. So, right, does a kick, doesn't put a whole lot on it necessarily, but enough where McDessie has to appreciate it and block it. Two hands up on it. He responds with a jab to the body again. What's he doing? Circling away. From the power hand. And there were times where he circled into the power hand. Don't get me wrong. But you can see there's these clear intervals where he's doing that. Stepping to the outside of the power. So what does Venata do? Steps in. Throws a jab to the body. Or across to the body, I should say. All right? Here we go. McDessie does a... From very far away. Sort of an inside kick. Venata kind of like fakes this a little bit. Um, in other words, he doesn't like... He kind of has him tricking, tricked here a little bit, like where he thinks it's going to be like a middle kick. Doesn't quite know exactly what it's going to be, right? There you see him push. And we're going to go through this in a bunch of different sequences, but here's the beginning of the end, right? While we're going to watch this in real time. I want you to point out something here. Look at this, okay? Everyone was asking, how, did he know that MacDessie was going to walk into it? Yes, he, yes, he did. And here's how he knew, Okay. Before, this foot is the one that's going to be the anchor, okay? And for this to properly work, his heel has to be pointed at the target. If Magdesi was rotating the other way, this kick would not look very good. It would be something kind of like what Weidman did to Rockhold where it misses and like the back of your leg wraps around their neck and then they can just take you down. You don't, you don't want that. You want them to either be stationary uh, or, you know, right in front of you to some extent. Uh, or circling into it. Like, he didn't necessarily need MacDessie to go one way, but he needed him to not go this way. And I want to point out something. Lando probably knew he was going to throw this. But the reason why he think I, I think he knew he was going to throw this is because, look at this, his foot hasn't even really touched the ground. And yes, he's sort of anchoring for the spin. But look who's on the move already. In other words, the question was, did Lando know he was going to do that? Well, one reason why he knew that was be, uh, that, that Magdessi was going to like, circle this way into away, uh, away from the power was one because he had a habit of it. But the other point is that physically he saw him do it. Look at this. Before he, this is the corner of his eye, he can see him moving. No one who's moving that direction has their, on the balls of their feet. At a minimum, he's not moving. Uh, better case scenario, he's moving into him. He knew before he, had, look, his heel is not even facing him yet. He knew before he spun, he had him. And as he spins, watch the bottom heel. Comes all the way around. The heel's almost there. Brings the leg up. Now look at that heel pointed to, I mean, cuts the center line right there. And now he can see. Could he see before? Yeah, even now he can see. And he can see him pushing off MacDessy, moving into it as he whips it. Up and look again, heel pointed right. I mean, almost split in the middle. Now it's a little bit further, but it's even better. 
Heel comes right up. Kablam. Boom. Look at that. And it's like on the chin slash, like it doesn't, doesn't quite get the temple, but it's on like the cheekbone chin. I mean, it's just a devastating shot. And, and then he falls. Look at that. Boom. I mean, it's incredible. Incredible timing. But it's not just incredible timing. It's incredible studying, understanding what an opponent does, measuring him with it a few times, showing him different looks with it. Remember, he threw the, the sidekick and would back him up. He threw the, the side, you know, t- uh, side leg kick or side kick to the leg, and he would then follow with a right hand. You know, just getting different reactions from him and watching how he circled. And then he knew he had him one time, faked it with a different kick, threw the side kick, saw him shifting off the balls of his feet, and went for it. It's a split-second reaction. Let's take out some different looks at it. Here we go. Stepping into it. Look, you can see where those jabs were landing. At least from McDessie, he had something to show for it. All right? Here's another one. But, well, this is not the best angle, but you can just see from here. All right? Pushes here. Balls of his feet, and that one's kind of flat, but balls of his feet. There's no way he's going that way, or he's highly unlikely. He can see him, sees him moving. Look at that. Sees him out of the corner of his eye, sees him moving before he even really fully plants that leg to spin. This is the one that you plant. Before it even touched the ground, he sees MacDessie on the move. Boom. And watch this. It's kind of noteworthy. Look where MacDessie's hands are. He thought it was going to be a, like a spinning back kick to the body. He got faked on it. He didn't. He not only walked into it. He got faked on it. It'd be one thing if you walked into it and you at least covered your face. Like it probably would do some damage, but maybe you'd be all right. But he thought it was going to go to the body. Didn't really think this guy was ever going to do this. Look at that heel pointed directly at him. Boom, right, right where it needed to be. And then watch him drop. Here's another angle at it. Pushes him. Watch Macdessy up, up, to, uh, up straight with his. Trunk, but sort of lowered stance generally. Watch Venata. He sees him before he even plants on the move. Before he even plants on the move. Look at that. Heel touches. He can see him. He knows he's got him dead to rights. He thinks he's going away from the power. And he is, except he's going away from the punching power. And he's walking right into that. It's just, it's how studying meets practice meets application. That's really all that there is to be said for it. An incredible, incredible job by um, Lando Venata. And it's something to be said for a guy who understands if I give a guy room to move, which is what I need him to do, if I practice this kick, which is something I need to do, if I understand my opponent through tape study, which is something I need to do, and if I innovate off ways to use this front leg sidekick, or you know, front leg, whatever you want to call it, um, it's not a front leg side kick to the body or anything, but like a front leg, like teep to the thigh. Uh, there's just a lot of innovation you can you can have there. And those Jackson guys, man, pay attention to how all the different guys at Jackson use it. Some use it for distance, some use it for measurement, some use it to hurt, and some use it like this to set up other things, like a spinning hook kick to the head. Pretty, pretty brilliant. Okay, so I wanted to just show something real quickly because I thought this was awesome. He does a sweep here that's kind of common in jiu-jitsu, but it's, uh, it's, you don't see a lot of it in the UFC, and you definitely don't see it a lot from big guys. This is, these are light heavyweights, man. So this is Misha Sukunov and um, Nikita Krilov. And this is not how he won. I just kind of wanted to show this real quickly. So uh, it, he, Krilov had been taken down and then finds a way to scramble and get back. So he's pressing Sukunov into the fence. Right, you can see him. He's going to get his hands clasped together. Give me just a second here. Uh, apparently, I have the worst computer on the face of the planet. So he's going to put his hands together. Right, you can see he's going to scoop and lift and then drop him. That's what's going to happen here. He's going to, or he's going to lift. But as soon as he gets his hands together, he's just going to pull him under so he lands flat on his back. Right, so you'll see here. Boom, picks him up. Right, his back's kind of curved. This would be bad deadlift for him, but it gets the job done. And then he dumps him right on the mat like that. You can see him when he's going to crash as such. But as he crashes, you can see he keeps that inside hook and he's going to put in the other one at the same time or very near after. Now, this was interesting to me. I don't know why Krilov didn't just jump to half guard here. He had everything he wanted to. He weirdly moves into but double butterfly, which I just didn't quite understand. But neither here nor there, I suppose. All right, so now we have double butterfly, basically. Or at least butterfly on one side, and I think this is like on the shin of the other. So it's not quite double butterfly, but it's got 
it's got something to be said for it, okay? So here we go. What's he going to do? This is what he's going to do. He's going to do what's called, uh, I mean, Marcelo Garcia was the person I thought invented it, or at least made it popular. It's called a shin sweep. And what you have to do is, number one, this leg has to be flat and extended, because you're actually going to use it as a rocking mechanism. And you're going to it's you're gonna see why it's a Marcelo Garcia kind of sweep, because it looks like he'll have, like, X guard. He almost does have X guard to an extent, anyway. Um, he had to have a different leg position here on the inside, but you get the idea. So what's going to happen is, here we are. You see this leg is going to go flat. And what's interesting is he's going to scoot one, this hand, this is the left hand of uh, Serkinov. He's going to scoot it underneath the leg, the other leg of Krilov. And he's going to use this hook to bring the foot to him. And you're going to see by the time he gets it, right, look at that hand real quickly. I want to show you something here. This is underneath the leg. Now that knee on this right leg of Krilov is down, and he's bringing this hook to him. But always remember something. In grappling, if you're on top and someone's playing guard, like you either want to have both your feet under you, or you, or if someone's underneath you, you want to have both your knees on the ground. If you don't have both your knees on the ground here, there's going to be a problem. And you can see this hook is being elevated, um, or I should say the leg of Krilov, the left leg is being elevated with the hook of Serkunov, he's just going to elevate them. If you've got one knee down and this one's up, you're in trouble. And they're doing something with their hooks, you're in trouble. You, you, it's just a rule of thumb. It's not like in every case this is terrible, but you don't you don't want to. And look, he's got his hands occupied on the mat. Like, this is just real bad. So then he yanks it up to him, right? He pulls it up. You can see now, he, you can see this is almost like an X guard, right? Almost. He's getting underneath the leg, getting his head to the side. Right, and he's going to use this hook, to, and he's going to grab it right around the shin, just like that. He's going to reach around. Okay, he has altered his body, so there's no other hook here with this one. Or I should say, this leg is not doing anything. He's going to rock with this one as he pulls on the ankle towards him, and then pushes out on the knee that way, and then sits up. And he's going to have a hook on the other leg here if, I, if he's doing it correctly, which I haven't even verified. But he gets the job done anyway. So it's pulling on the ankle, pushing on that knee. It's not painful. It doesn't hurt you. And then this leg will help you rock and sit you up uh, as you as you do it. And you'll just come right up like that. See how he pushes? He comes. And as this picture gets better, you can see head near the hip. Uh, his left arm is underneath the leg. He's still pushing, grabbing the ankle, and he sits right on up. Look at that. Sits right on up. He lets go here, and you can see he's blocking the shin. And what normally would happen is you would let this go and then pass to this side. I think he didn't want to get flipped. I think he didn't want to get flipped, so he cross-faces here and kind of just sort of drives the hook down, and you'll see what will eventually happen is he'll just free that he like swims out and frees that uh, hook, right? And he, oh, and by the way, what does he do here? He doesn't want to get rolled. Like Krilov wants to roll backwards here, like all the way through. You'll see him grab his, you'll see him use his own leg, Kril, uh, uh, Sukunov, to like put behind this leg as a post. Whoop, like that. See that? So he doesn't go all the way completely over. They come back down, right, after they finish rocking. You can see under the leg here. That's what he had the whole time, cross facing. He's cross-facing him so hard, he's making him look away. And he doesn't even have the elbow deep. I just want to point out something. Whenever you cross-face someone, it's not merely painful. It's not merely that you want to control them. And you don't necessarily have to get them to look away to control them. But the best demonstration that it's working is you're making them look away. Look at Krilov. He's looking all the way away. Pretty nasty. And then he just comes and steps out. You see he steps out and then... Gets his base. Real quickly, one more time just to show you with this. You don't get a good look on one side of it just because of the way this camera angle works. So here he is, semi-double butterfly, right? What's he going to do? He's going to stick that leg out. He's going to dive underneath. He wants to get between the ass and the heel here. He wants to dig his leg underneath, and he wants to bring that hip close to his head, shoulder, or his, you know, close to his shoulder or whatever, right? And you can't quite see it, and Krilov probably doesn't know exactly what's happening here. Meanwhile, what is he doing? He's using that that uh, this outside hook to not only bring his foot and knee off the ground, but to bring it to him, right? As he gets further and further underneath, 
All right, look how close that is now. He's now all the way out. This leg is free. This leg is underneath. And he's got a head on a hip while he's going underneath the leg. What's he going to do? He's going to grab that ankle, pull the ankle, drive his knee out as he uses this leg to kick out and sit up just like that. And now he's just going to use the momentum and he's going to push forward. He's going to get on top, right? He has to block this. He doesn't want to keep rocking uh, too far forward. So he sets up a blocking mechanism. They rock back down to the mat. There you see him making him look away, got him tied up. Again, most, most of the time what you do is you'd pass that way, but the fence is here, so he can't. And so he just pops that leg out, and there you go. I just want to point out, like, for a big man to do that underneath is not common. Uh, nicely executed, got the whole thing right. Look how tightly wrapped up he is here. You know, eventually Krilov would get to his feet, and Sukunov would get that same side arm in guillotine, the Pat Kern one, the Pedro Munoz one. Um, but it's just great to see a big man have jiu-jitsu like this off of his back, and it's great between this guy and guys like Jared Cannonier and Krilov himself, it's great to see some prospects in the UFC's light heavyweight division, isn't it? Pretty nice. Great job there by Misha Sukunov. Last but not least, let's take a look at the fights in the week ahead. There's a couple of them. It's still another UFC Bellator weekend. There's been a few of these, I know. Um, now, the only difference is there are still two more UFC events left in the year, this will be the last Bellator event, Bellator 169, and I actually pre-recorded this segment and then got a news update that there were some changes to it, so I'm recording it again with the new updates. This will be, I believe, at the 3 Arena, if I'm not mistaken, yes, in Dublin, Ireland, okay? It's supposed to take place on December 16th. I don't know when Spike's going to air it. Your guess is as good as mine, but here is the main card. Uh, Mo Lawal taking on Satoshi Ishii at heavyweight, a featherweight co event between uh, rising prospect James Gallagher and Anthony Taylor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Daniel Weishel is back. He'll take on Brian Moore. And then in a featherweight feature bout, you'll have Sinead Kavanaugh taking on Elena uh, Kalindio, Kalinodu. I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name. A uh, bantamweight feature bout between Shea Walsh and Louise Tosta. You'll recall that uh, Bruna Vargas was supposed to be on the main card, but that fight has been scrapped. Then the uh, updated Bama 27 main card that's a part of this whole event you're going to have Tom Dukenwa taking on Alan uh, Philippot, Philippo, however you pronounce it properly. Ronnie Mann versus Martin Stapleton. Dylan Tuke versus Sean Tobin. Brian Moore versus Nicholas Backstrom, not the one from the Washington Capitals. Uh, Kiefer Crosby taking on Connor Reardon. And then Nathan Jones versus Walter Gahadza. There you go. That is Bellator 169, King Mo versus Ishii in Dublin. Now, uh, the second to last. UFC event. Remember, the last one will be December 30th, UFC 207, but this weekend is going to be UFC on Fox 22, also known as UFC on Fox, uh, Van Zant versus Waterson. This will be at the Golden One Center in Sacramento, California, obviously headlined by Paige Van Zant versus Michelle Waterson, Sage Northcutt taking on Mickey Gall, that should be a fun one, Uriah Faber in his last career fight taking on Brad Pickett, Alan Joban versus Mike Perry. Luis Henrique Da Silva taking on Paul Craig. That will be the first fight, or I should say the last fight on the prelim card, but I'm reading top to bottom. Uh, Cole Miller will face uh, Mizuta Hirota. Brian Barbarina off his nice win over Arlie Alves will take on Colby Covington. James Moon Tossery versus Alex Morono. Josh Emmett versus Scott Holtzman. Leslie Peacemaker Smith versus Irene Aldana or Irene Aldana, however you want to pronounce it. And then on the fight pass portion of the card, Eddie Wineland taking on Takeya Mizugaki, Hector Sandoval versus Freddie Serrano, Freddie Serrano, and then Boyan Velikovic taking on Sultan Aliyev, um, or Aliyev, however that's properly pronounced either. I don't know. Uh, all right, guys, thank you so much for watching today. That's it. I'm done. Really appreciate your time. I hope you enjoyed the fights this past weekend. Hope you enjoy the upcoming fights. I will talk to you on this podcast next Monday. If you have any uh, complaints, compliments, bitches, gripes, smart-ass remarks, send them to luke.thomas at sbnation.com. You can also uh, reach me on Twitter at sbnlukethomas, and you can like me on Facebook, facebook.com slash News. Thank you guys for watching, and until next time, enjoy the fights.